I am so excited about the lesson tonight because to me, uh, the third week of uh, discipling new believers is one of the most exciting weeks. And the reason is this. This is going to sound very strange to you, but it's very true. When you begin discipling a new believer that has just come to Jesus Christ, um, week three is the real point at which they're going to have a long-term commitment or even they're going to start fading away. Week three is the lesson where they either show up and they're excited about continuing their growth and growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ, or they have found an excuse or a reason not to be here because, well, world is creeping back in. The past is creeping back in. We're going to talk about the kingdom of God today. We're going to talk about how that although you are living a changed life and the change has taken place inside of you and you're beginning to live that change on the outside, the truth is not a whole lot of things around you have probably changed. Uh, you're probably living in the same house, probably driving the same car, working the same job, visiting most of the same people, getting the same conversations from coworkers, and uh, probably not a whole lot of things on the outside have influenced the new person that you are becoming. Now, let me step back for just a moment and remind you, when you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you surrendered your heart. You said that things inside of me need to change the things outside of me. Instead of waiting for things on the outside to change your life and influence you, you've decided that on the inside, something needed to change. You found that Jesus Christ could deal with your pain. He could deal with your sin. He could deal with your sorrow. He could deal with the effects of your past. And so you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have a surrendered heart. God told you to stop doing the things that you were sinfully doing, and he started to tell you, started, he wanted you to start doing new things. And he told you what to begin doing. And one of those things was what we talked about last week, having a growing heart. In having a growing heart, he takes the hard old seed of who you used to be. He is now, you've surrendered that to him. He is now planting it into his word. As he's putting it into his word, he is going to begin to water and nurture and reveal and teach you more and more about becoming a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, if you know that you have a surrendered heart, you're continuing on the path of a growing heart. Well, this week is very exciting because this week we start talking about having a servant heart. Now, I gave you some instructions before on how you can remind yourself. When you say that I have a surrendered heart, just put your hands over your heart. Right over there where you're at. Just, just right where you're at. Put your hands over your heart and just say, I have a surrendered heart. And as an example, just lift your hands of surrender to God. Everybody do that with me one more time. Put your hands over your heart. I have a surrendered heart. Last week we talked about, I have a, now put your hands over your heart again. Again, each one of these begin with your heart. And you're going to stretch them out and say, I have a growing heart. I have a growing heart. Now hopefully last week in our lesson, God was speaking to you and you decided that you were going to be baptized and that you were going to be a witness to your friends and family by inviting others to your baptism. That's your first witness. That's the first outward expression of, of the inward change that takes place in your life. This is, this is so exciting because now you begin to experience and realize that you don't wait for things on the outside to begin to change so that you feel change on the inside, but because of the change on the inside, you want to start influencing things on the outside. Well, along with that, well, you know, you you have to recognize that as you begin walking and you begin living this new life through Jesus Christ, you're going to have to have a servant's heart. Now, like this, we just put your hands over your heart and you go like this. You say, I have a servant's heart. You're just bowing before God. You're bowing even before others. You're just wanting to share with them, surrendering your heart, surrendering your life now as a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm here to serve others as Jesus would serve them. So I have a servant's heart. Everybody do that one more time. Put your hands over your heart. I have a servant's heart. Now, as you put them together, you're going to say, I have a surrendered heart. I have a growing heart. I have a servant heart. Now, as we begin the lesson today, we've got three different texts that we're going to be studying. If you're discipling a new believer, again, you want to do this in the intimacy of your home or their home, someplace 
place where you have some time. We would take time to usually listen to a worship song and explain to them what worship is. We would also take some time to pray. And in prayer, we would want the new believer to just listen to us pray so that they can learn what it means to pray and how to pray. I'm going to pray for us as we get started today, and I want you to just listen for a few moments. And then if you've been a believer for a long time, you can join me in praying, but listen as we pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for every opportunity to spend time with you. Jesus, we love you and we thank you that you died for our sins and that you made a way for us to come into our Father's house, into our Father's heart. I ask today, Father, that you would just receive us and that you would send the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight. Thank you that you did forgive us of our sins, that you have started a new life in us. Thank you that you have not forgotten us, but every time that we called, you've answered to us. Father, I ask that tonight through Jesus Christ, would you just open your word and help us to see Jesus setting the example of how you would like for us to live our life for you. Father, our desire is to bring you glory and to bring you honor for other people to see the works that we do and to glorify you, for them to see our changed lives and ask us, and for us to give an answer. Jesus, we love you. We appreciate you so much that you came into this world and that you came to just give an example to us, to lead us in the right way, and we choose to follow you. Holy Spirit, enter into every home, enter into every room, enter into this sanctuary, enter into every life that our minds will now be opened to hear what the Father is speaking to us. What Jesus has already said, and you want to reveal to us. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Bible talks to us about the new person that we are becoming. And in it, talking about the new person, he gives different examples and stories of what this looks like. And today we're going to look at a couple of different scriptures, beginning with Matthew chapter 5. Now, if you have your Bible, or if you have a mobile app on your, uh, on your phone, you want to go to your Bible, And in your Bible, you want to go to the New Testament. You're going to go to the book of Matthew. Uh, It's the very first book of the New Testament. Now, if you're discipling a new believer, again, show them how to use their Bible. Show them how to find the scriptures. Show them how to use the Bible app on their phone. And take them to Matthew chapter 5, which is where we're going to begin. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading at verse 13 through verse 16. Now, I want you to know that Jesus is talking to us. Every time that Jesus is talking in the scriptures to his disciples, every time that he is talking in the synagogue, every time that he is talking to others, he's talking to you and I. And any time that you see him talking with his disciples, well, you are now that disciple. He's talking to you. So when we read these words, we want to know that Jesus is talking to us tonight. So Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. So go to chapter 5, go down until you find verse 13, and here's what he says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So looking at verse number 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, I don't know if you like a lot of salt, but a lot of people I know like a lot of salt. In fact, there's some people I know of that they don't even taste their food, but they're already putting salt on it because they want to taste the salt in whatever they're eating. They're craving that salt. I'm not one of those people. My wife is one of those. If there's not little white caps on her food from the salt, there's not enough salt on it. And and people say, well, you might need to add a little salt. No, I I try not to do that. But salt is important because, because it has a purpose and people desire that. 
So you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He turned on the light inside of you. You were living in darkness. You were living in sin. Now he's turned that light on. And because he's turned that light on, he wants your light to shine before other people, not just at home, not just at church, not just when you're away from others. Everywhere you go, you are supposed to be the shining light, this new person that God has made inside of you. In fact, notice what he says, what happens in verse 16. Look at verse number 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that you may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, now here's what he means. He's saying that you have a servant's heart. He turns the light on inside of you so that you can serve. And how you serve in your life, you're serving God first. And the way that you serve God is by doing what Jesus Christ did. Let me say that again. The way that you begin is that you remember you are serving God and everything that you do, you do the way that Jesus taught us to do it. As you're doing that, there's this light that begins to illuminate, and it's the light of Jesus Christ inside of you, and other people see that you don't want to cuss anymore, you don't want to hang out at certain places anymore, you've changed the way that you dress maybe, you, you, there's things, things that both physically, conversationally, operationally, spiritually, everything about you has transformed. And it may be a little bit slow, but it's transforming. And people are recognizing this. And some people, now, now here's the evidence sometimes that you're living a changed life. Other people will criticize you. Other people will criticize the new life that you've decided to start living. That's okay. That is still an evidence of your changed life. Now, a servant's heart goes beyond just asking to, be, to, to, to do something. A servant's heart is literally becoming obedient to what Jesus told us to do. Let me say that again. A servant's heart is not waiting for someone else to tell us what to do. A servant's heart immediately begins doing what Jesus already told us to do. So those of us that say, well, I have a servant's heart. If somebody needs something done, they'll let me know. No, no, a servant's heart sees the need and does it without having to be asked to do it. Wow. Really? Absolutely. That's a servant's heart. You don't have to wait. Now, we're going to talk about a servant's heart and relationships and why this is so important about letting your light shine. If you have your Bibles, again, we're going to go now to Matthew chapter 18. So you're at Matthew chapter 5. Just turn over a few pages there and you'll go over to Matthew chapter 18. And when you get to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to go down to verse number 24. So verse number 24. And we're going to begin reading. And usually when you're discipling new believers, again, you want to have them read it. And you're going to want to read it twice, but you have them read it so that they become familiar with reading the Bible. It's okay if it takes them a little while to read. Nobody's in a hurry. There's no need to rush through anything. Uh, if they're a slow reader, that's okay. If you need to help them with words, help them with words. It's not a problem. Here we go. Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse number 24. Are you ready? As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? 
In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now we're going to read this one more time, and I want to point out a few things about this story. So Jesus is talking with his disciples. One of the disciples has said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, seven times 70. And then he begins to tell this story. Now, if you go back to verse, uh, verse 23, he actually says that it's a king. Now, I use the word master because later he continues to use the word, the word master. He's showing a relationship. So I want to put this into perspective for you. Jesus is the king. Our Father is the King. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Now that you are a new believer in Jesus Christ, you are now living in the kingdom of God. The rest of the world may look the same as it did yesterday, but with spiritual eyes, you are now living in the kingdom of God. And as you're living in the kingdom of God, you live as a servant of Jesus Christ, a servant of God and His Word. Now notice in the story, we have a master, we have a servant, we have a fellow servant, and we have other servants. Do you see how that word is consistent throughout this story? And he's focusing on this one man and his heart. He's dealing with his heart. Let's go back and let's read it again, and then we're going to talk about this. Let's go back to verse number 24. And he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Look at that. Look at that. He and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had been thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, the other servants, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant. Now notice the change. Now the master calls him, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And Jesus finishes with saying, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now specifically what we're talking about is a servant's heart. This parable is talking about servants and their attitude and their behavior. Let's ask ourselves the question, what was the attitude of the master to the servant who owed much. What was his attitude towards that servant? Well, if you look at verse 24, he said a man owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Now, I don't know how you run up a, bet, a debt of 10,000 bags of gold, but that's a large debt. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you are that, that far in debt. I don't know, I, I can't imagine owing someone that much money. But I can tell you, that there are things in our lives that sometimes happen in conversations, in relationships, in, uh, in finances, in, in many different areas of our life that it builds up this debt, something that, oh, I'll never forgive them. I will, they, not, they, I'm never going to get over that one. No way. I, you know, so you can see he's giving a demonstration of how large this debt is, how heavy this debt is that this man has incurred. The master ordered that he and his wife and his children. This was something that the master was so, man, you owe me everything. You owe me your life because of what happened here. He ordered that his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now, can you imagine how that man felt? 
all of a sudden, you know, we, we struggle at times. And my heart goes out to many people during this pandemic, during this time that we're living through right now, because many people have had to go home and say, I don't have a job anymore. Some people have had to go home and say, I, I've been furloughed and I'm not going to have the income that I've had. And, and, and it's, it's difficult. It's a struggle. And things begin to impact our families and impact other things in our lives. And I want you to understand that, that, that sin impacts everything about you. There are some things that you may have done in your old sinful ways that placed a weight on your family, that placed a weight on your possessions, that placed a weight on your entire life. I've seen people who, because of addictions to uh, anything from drugs to alcohol to gambling to shopping to uh, selfishness to self-centeredness to, to various things that have run up thousands of dollars in credit card bills, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in pay. I, I, I don't understand how people uh, want to do this, but they have car payments that are equal to a house payment. I, I, I don't understand. I, I don't want to do that. That's me personally. Maybe you have. But understand that in this story, this master, this king was demanding everything that this man owned, everything to pay back the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me. It was because of the servant's attitude towards the king. He wanted to protect his home. He wanted to save his children. He wanted to save his, 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 his assets. He wanted, to, he wanted to be able to do things over again. He wanted to be released from this debt. But he's saying to him, look, I will pay back everything. Give me some more time. I'm going to make this happen. I, I love my wife. I love my children. I love these things. I don't want to lose them. And how many times have we in the same mind and in the same heart because of sin, We've come back to God and said, I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose my children. I don't want to lose the things in my life. I don't, I, oh God, help me. And, and so we begin to beg God. We begin to plead to God. We begin to cry out to God. Give me some time. Help me with this. Help me with, and I'll do things completely differently. And notice the response of the master. The master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. And that's what God does. God says, I see all of the mess. I see all of uh, uh, what you've racked up and all of the bad decisions of your yesterdays. If you take the sum of all of your yesterdays, they equal what you are today. And you say, I don't like the way that that looks. I don't like what it's, it's, it has become or what I'm becoming. And so you decide, I'm going to take it to Jesus. You take it to Jesus because who knows what to do with it? The Heavenly Father. And the Heavenly Father is the one who says, I forgive you. All of the debt. Jesus says, I paid it all. I've paid it all. It's paid in full. You can go and be free from it. And so this man and the master has worked out a relationship where the master has forgiven him the debt. He saw something in his attitude, something in his request, but then things changed. Then things changed. Look at verses 28 through 30. What was the attitude of the servant to his fellow servant? You see, everything that God does for us, he is not just doing for us. He's doing for us to do for others. Let me say that again. Everything that God is doing for us, that he does in us, he does through us so that he can also do it for others. So in verse 28, we find the attitude of the servant to his fellow servant. He found his fellow servant who owed him a hundred silver coins grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The man only owed him a hundred silver coins. By far much less than the hundred bags of gold that he owed to the other. But here he is demanding that this man pay him back everything. And isn't that just the attitude that sometimes we begin to experience? Well, you know, I know that God has forgiven me, but, but I don't know about this person. I don't know about this circumstance. I don't know about these other things. And so I'm not going to let it go. They still owe me an explanation. They still owe me an apology. They still owe me the money. They still owe me. And we don't consider the fact that probably whatever that other person did to offend you, they did it in sin also. Mm -hmm. It was a sinful nature. It was a sinful lifestyle. And out of that sinful way of, 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 of actions and attitude, and now you have a changed heart. You have a changed life. You are living a new life, but you're holding it against other people who did the same thing you did. 
See, a servant's heart says, I want to go out and serve God, not man. And as I'm serving God, I want to serve God the way that he serves me, the things that he's done towards me. Now notice, the exact same thing happens here. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Same thing that he did. When he was called before the master, the master said, hey, pay up. He begged him, fell on his knees. This man did the same thing. Be patient with me. Same thing that he said. I will pay it back. Same thing he said. Everything that he said, his fellow servant is now saying to him. But now he has a different attitude. He refused. He refused and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, this, this, is, this, is, a, this is a conundrum to me because I don't understand how you throw someone in prison and expect them to pay a debt. I don't understand that. But because he insisted on having his will, having his way, getting justice for himself, he insisted, you're going to pay for what you did to me. And so I'm going to put you in prison until you can pay the debt. Do you understand that there are some debts that we encounter in life that can't be repaid by anything other than Jesus Christ? His love, his mercy his compassion, and some of the people that hurt you, abused you, some people out there that led you astray, some people that said things about you, maybe they're still even saying things about you. They're doing these things because they don't know the love of God. They have not experienced the light. They have not experienced the salt. They have not experienced that there is something that can change their life as well. And someone needs to show them, someone needs to share with them a changed life. And I hope that's going to be you. As you look at this, do you recognize that the very attitude that we brought to Jesus when we confessed our sins and we received Him as Savior is the same attitude that we need to have towards others who have offended us. Christ did not reject us. Christ did not condemn us. Christ did not say, come back another day. Christ did not say, you are unsavable. You're unsalvageable. I can't do anything with you. Who would ever want to live? No, He didn't do any of those things. He said, if you come to me, I will receive you. I will not cast you out. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Well, it's the same thing as we live in this world and we go into our homes and we go into our neighborhoods and we go among our families, we go among our jobs and we're around other people, fellow servants, fellow servants. What is your attitude towards that fellow servant? What is your behavior towards that fellow servant? Because your attitude and your actions and your words all as a disciple of Jesus Christ should reflect the new life that he's placed inside of you, the new heart that you are now living. And so as a servant, other people are watching. Let's go to the next one. What did the other servants do? I love that. What did the other servants do? And what did the master say to the servant? Well, look at verse 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged outraged and he went and told and they went and told their master everything that had happened now i find it interesting that they were outraged by what they saw because it's evident that they must have known that this man had already been forgiven the large debt by the master do you see that so somewhere along the line, he probably came out and said, oh my goodness, the master's completely forgiven my debt. I owe nobody, oh my goodness, this is amazing, it's wonderful. What a wonderful master, I've been forgiven. I, it's, it's all, I owed him so much money. A hundred bags of gold, and he wrote it off. Can you believe that? The king, the master wrote off a hundred bags of gold? so that he could spare me, so that he could spare my family, so that he could spare my life, so, oh, so that I could have another chance, so that I could start over again. Oh my goodness, this is wonderful, I'm sure. But then reality set in. And the reality was that although he had been forgiven for the 100 bags of gold, he probably still needed some money. He probably still needed some resource. And so guess what he's gonna do? 
He's going to go collecting from others that he used the hundred bags of gold to lend to. Do you see that? Yeah. So the hundred bags of gold that's already been forgiven, he's not going to forgive others because he knows that he gave that to others. And so he goes and he, now, now, now notice this. I like the way that this is written. He says that he went out and he found, he found another servant. He was looking for him. He was looking for him. Now, when he found him, other people were watching. Let's come back to the other people. The other people who now know that he's been forgiven of one debt, and now he's holding a grudge on the other debt, they become outraged that this man will not forgive this small debt that this man owes to him. And so they, instead of correcting him, instead of telling him, they went back to the master. They went back to the master and told him what had happened. Well, the master called the servant in again. But this time, he changes his name. You wicked servant. You wicked servant. Why is he a wicked servant? Because he received good and went out and did evil. And that's what wickedness is. That's what wickedness is. So when I know that I've been forgiven of great things by God, and yet I hold a grudge against others, that's not right. That's not God's plan. That's not what God intended. In his forgiving me, he was forgiving everything that I had done. He was forgiving all of those past things, and he's dealing with the effects of those things. And when I go out and I start accusing other people of the very things that I was just forgiven of, instead of being a help to them, instead of being a servant to them, well, the rest of the world is watching. The rest of the world is watching. And the rest of the world is waiting to watch you slip, to watch you fall, to watch your attitude, to watch your actions, so that they can be quick. And they don't take it to a master as this parable didn't know. They are very quick to take it to Twitter. They are very quick to take it to Facebook. They are very quickly taking it to some other social media so that everybody knows what you did to hurt them. And then all of your friends and neighbors and family who are also on Facebook get to like, but they don't get to dislike. Isn't that interesting? And they get to post comments, text without context. They get to have these things. Why? Because they're watching you. Now, I want to be very careful here because I want you to understand that you're not perfect and neither am I. None of us are perfect. But we can choose to have the right attitude and the right servant's heart with others. Notice this master was so angry. He was so angry that he made it known that he handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. I have no idea what that means, but it doesn't sound good. Can I pause there for a moment? It doesn't sound good. I mean, who wants to be tortured? Nobody wants to be tortured. And yet, listen to me very carefully. Some of us, knowing that we have been forgiven of our sins, but not forgiving our brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully, are living a tortured life because we're living under the pains of that unforgiveness. Wow. It's true. It's true. It's because we don't want to allow the great mercy and the great love to flow through us, the light to be shining under the darkness of other people's lives. Not so that we can condemn them, not that we can push them down, not that we can feel, no, but so that we can go and share the gospel with them and let them know that, look, I know, but I also know who can deal with it. I know who has the answer to our relationship. I know who can deal with this, this frustration that we have between us. I know who can heal the mother-daughter relationship. I know who can heal the parent-child relationship. I know who can restore the marriage. I know who is able to restore the business. I know who can bring the family back. You see, all of these things are a part of what is in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God is at work around you. But He saved you to give you a servant's heart to be a light and to be the salt to other people. Now notice this, he turns him over until he can pay back all that he owes. And I'm gonna tell you right now, in my past and in my life, there's a song that we used to sing, it just came to my mind a long time ago, uh, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. Do you remember that song? Yes. It's true. 
He paid a debt he didn't owe. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. But Jesus washed my sins away. And I want you to understand that he can wash away the sins of others as well. And when we recognize the great debt, the hundred bags of gold, when we remember how that we begged, how that we fell down at his feet, how that we fell down at the cross, and we confessed, and he forgave and started a new life in us, well, now it's time for us to go out and live that new life in such a way that others can see that light and that life. Now notice, what is God speaking to you today? What is God speaking to you today? Notice this verse. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you. Each of you. Unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart. Now I'm going to pray in just a moment. And I'm going to ask you to do something. We, we've got an exercise we're going to do in a moment, but, but here's something I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray. And as I'm praying for just the next few moments, I want you to just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you in such a way that He just brings back to your memory and brings into your heart the willingness to forgive people that you haven't forgiven. People that maybe you need to call. People that you need to restore relationship. People that, that, that God needs to help you to become that servant and that light. And I'm going to teach you in a few minutes on how to share your story with others. But first, I want us to pray because I think God is speaking to someone right now about why you're still living a tormented life, why you're still frustrated, why, why you're still in this place. The, the enemy has you bound. You may be saved. You may know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but you know that you're frustrated in your mind. You're frustrated in your life. You're holding on to old baggage. You're holding on to old things. And, and, and you need to be willing to trust God with them and say, Lord, I want to be that servant that goes and makes a difference in things. Not waiting for someone to come and tell me what to do, but going to do what you already told me to do. Heavenly Father, your love is so great and so broad. Your all-seeing eye doesn't miss anything. You're aware of everything in my life, my past, my present, and you and you alone know the days that lay ahead of me. Father, I come to you because there is a world that is broken and hurting. There are lives that do not know Jesus as their personal Savior. And they continue in a life of just pain, destruction, sorrow. But you have saved our lives. Each one of us that are under my voice right now, you have changed our life. And I ask that you would just send the Holy Spirit, Father. Send the Holy Spirit to speak to them right now that they would write down the names of people that they need to forgive that they need to begin today to begin to forgive and that you will guide them in that. Father, I thank you right now that you're going to use us as your disciples to win lost people by our being both the salt and the light of this world and going to those that we've offended and who've offended us that we can bring life in Jesus' name. Now just take a few moments and write down any names that come to you right now. Anything that you know that you've done that you need to go to someone and ask them to forgive you. Maybe you need to go back and redo some works. Not so that you're seen, not because of you, but so that others can see the Father and glorify Him. That's what He's saying here. He wants you to forgive. If you don't, the Father will treat you the same way. Now, Let's work on something for tonight. If you've got a blank piece of paper or you have one of the handouts that I've given to you, on the handout you're going to see that there is a space there for you to do some writing. And what I want to teach you how to do today is how to tell your story. How to tell your story. Now we're talking about, this is the handout. If you have the handout, there's a side on it that has some spaces that you can write in. And one of those spaces says at the top, what's your story? Your life before Jesus Christ. Now I want you to take just a few moments and take a pen, pencil, and I, and I want you to begin writing down your life before Jesus Christ. But I want, I want to share this with you. Sharing your story with others should take about three minutes. If it takes more than three minutes, you're probably preaching a sermon more than you're sharing your story. 
If you're still talking after five minutes, you might as well pause and take an offering because at that point you're having church and people really are not listening. So you have about three minutes to, to really communicate to people. Otherwise, they start losing interest. So in that three minutes, you want to communicate your life before Jesus Christ, how you came to know Jesus Christ, and your life with Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a little bit of guidelines here. Your life before Jesus Christ, it's not what you did but how sin made you live and feel. I don't want to know how many people you slept with. I don't want to know how many different drugs you did. I'm not interested in, in you know, I don't want to play, you know, connect the dots with the, the, the this, no, no, no. All I want to know is how it made you feel. I don't need to know the types of drugs that you were taking, who you took them with. I don't need you to tell somebody else's story or tell on anybody else in your story. What we're talking about specifically is how did sin make you feel? I was angry. I was hopeless. Uh, I, I wanted to die. I hear that so many times from people. I literally just wanted to die. I was rebellious. I hated people. I was selfish. You see, those are the types of things that describe what our emotions, what sin was doing to us, and how we were feeling about it before we came to Jesus Christ. And people relate to that. You see, people don't want to hear Christ's story until they've heard your story. If you tell them your story, then they can relate to that and believe that he can do the same thing for them. So we've got to be able to communicate our story. And don't be ashamed of your story. Don't be ashamed of being able to share the, the work of Jesus Christ. Now, now, I'm not talking about taking pride and gloating over the sins that you did in the past. You know, I don't want to know about, you know, gangs and people you killed and cars you stole and all these. I don't want to know all those things. How, how you make yourself really sinful doesn't help anything. It's talking about how you felt emotionally, how you felt spiritually. So just take a few minutes right now and just I'm, I'm going to give you a few minutes to just write that down. What were you feeling at that time? I know that when I came to know Jesus Christ, Many times, as a matter of fact, that I did throughout the course of my life. But there was one time that I had just become very, uh, I had become very arrogant. Uh, I had become very selfish. Uh, I didn't want to give to other people. Uh, I had become very stingy with others. I had become uh, and abusive of other people. I, I would take the best that I could out of them at work or uh, in other places. And then after I didn't need them anymore, it was easy to just discard them. And, and, and I just really felt empty and lonely, and, and I knew that I wasn't in the right relationship with God. In fact, I would pray, but I didn't feel anything. I, I, I would just felt completely detached. Those are the types of things that are your life before Jesus Christ. Now, in the second part, about how you receive Jesus Christ. How and where were you when you chose to repent and believe in Jesus as Savior. How and where you chose to repent and believe in Jesus as Savior. And I want you to include those words, repent and believe. So maybe someone invited you to a revival service and you went down to the altar and the evangelist was preaching and you decided to give your heart to Jesus. So you repented and you believed. You repented and you re believed. I want you to make sure that you include those two words. Maybe someone came to your house and they were meeting with you. Maybe you were in a hospital bed and someone came to visit with you. Maybe you were alone watching a television uh, broadcast, an evangelist speaking. I remember one story that uh, a young lady was hiding. She was hiding from her mom and dad who were having a horrible argument and she just was angry with her life and, and, and everything. But she had a Bible. And she took this Bible and she was sitting in her closet. And through the light that was coming through the crack of the door, she was reading her Bible. And she saw how that God loved her and how that God could, could change in her life. And, and she just confessed. And she said, Jesus, I need you, God. I need your help. I believe in you as my Savior. She began to follow Jesus Christ right there in the closet by herself. She was 12 years old. I've had other people who have shared the testimony of just being alone. One man was on his way, on his way to kill his father-in-law. He had a knife. He was angry. He had been drinking. He was sitting outside of his truck and he was looking at the moon and all of a sudden he 
hear a voice speaking to him. And it was God. And God began to speak with him. And things from his childhood he began to be reminded of. He repented, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Now get this. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ, got in his truck, drove to his father-in-law's house, went into his father-in-law's house to announce to him that he was originally on his way to kill him. And he went in and asked his father-in-law to forgive him. His father-in-law also received Jesus Christ. You say, how is that possible? It's the love of God. How did you come to know Jesus Christ? It's the power of your story. Where were you? What were you doing? How did you receive Jesus Christ? But be sure and include those words. I repented and believed. I repented of my sins. We talked about that last week, what repentance is. And I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now the third part. Your life since Jesus Christ. Your new life and how you chose to obey and follow Jesus Christ. You no longer hate, but now you love others. So you're going back to what you originally were like. I now love to give to other people. I, I love to give to other people. I'm not stingy. I'm not selfish. I broke that shopping addiction, which was all about me. I stopped being arrogant towards other people. Uh, I, I, I want to serve other people and help them where I can. I look for value in helping people in every opportunity that I can. Uh, people are valuable and important to me and important to God. So you're writing things about how your life is now since Jesus Christ. Hopefully you can say whatever your life was before. If, if you were rebellious, I'm no longer rebellious. I hated my family. I love my family. Uh, I was, you know, I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. I didn't want to live any longer. Now I love to live. I love the joy and the peace that God brings to every day of my life. That's the power of your story. That's the power of your story. And when you begin to share your story with others, it's going to impact their life. You see, let's go to this next slide. A servant's heart forgives and shares their story with others. Who will you share your story with? Who will you share your story with? Now, I know I feel like I've rushed through this a little bit, and I, and I don't mean to. I really want you to take the time to write your story. And then I want you to practice sharing your story. I want you to begin practice sharing your story with fellow Christian believers first. And maybe they can even help you in writing your story. Pastor Greg, one of the things that I've encouraged pastors to do is, as they have new believers and even other believers in their church, ask them to share their story, record it, and every Sunday morning, take about three minutes and share someone's testimony because it's going to speak to someone in your audience. It's going to speak to someone out there because they're going to say, hey, that sounds like me. That's my life. That's where I am right now. If he changed their life, I believe he can change mine. Sharing your story with others. Practice telling your story with Christian friends to help you. Do not be ashamed of your story. It is the power to help others. It is the power to help others. And here's an interesting thing about sharing your story with others, especially if you're talking about friends and family. They already know you. They already know your past. They already know, and so they know when you're making things up, and they know when you're telling the truth. Don't be ashamed of your story. Don't be ashamed of your story. Pray for the people you need to forgive and share your story with. Now, what I mean by that is last week, I asked you to write down the names of five people that you're going to invite to your baptism. Now, now I'm going to give you some instructions here. On June 28th, you're going to have water baptism. I want as many people as possible to be baptized. You say, oh, I was baptized when I was 14. Be baptized again. You say, oh, I don't... You I want you to be baptized again. Well, do we really need to do that? Yes, you really need to do that. And I'm going to tell you why. Last week, I asked you to think of five people that you're going to invite to your baptism. Now, what I want you to plan to do is Pastor Greg, as you're doing the water baptism, he's going to ask you to share your story before you're baptized. He's going to ask you to share your story. 
And in less than three minutes, you're going to share your life before Jesus Christ, how you came to Jesus Christ, your life with Jesus Christ, and your water baptism is a public witness to your friends and family that you invited. Do you see that? It's your first witness. It's telling your story. They then will have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And when they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're going to learn how to write their story. They're going to invite their friends and family to their baptism. They're going to continue making disciples. Now, celebrate it. Enjoy it. Invite other people to come. But share your story. Your life before Christ, how you came to Christ, your life with Jesus Christ. Lesson three, I have a servant heart. I want you to read this with me if you can, right there in your screen, uh, on the screen there if you're watching this or uh, if it's up here behind me, I just, it's, you just follow along. I want you to, I recognize my new life is to serve Jesus Christ in every area of my life, serving Christ, my church, and community. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm looking for every opportunity to share my story, Christ's story, and introducing others to Jesus Christ. With a servant's heart, I will go and share my story and continue praying for others. Now that's what our lesson is about today. Now I want to leave you with one more scripture. I'm going to give this back to Pastor Greg, but in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We studied about the servant. We talked about being salt. We talked about being the light of the world. Now let's look at what Jesus said to us. Here's what Jesus said to us as disciples. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. That means all of your friends, all of your family, everyone that you can come in contact with, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am so glad you've made it to week three. You have a surrendered heart. You have a growing heart. You have a servant's heart. Work on your story. Practice your story. Three minutes or less. Invite five people to be baptized. Right here online, just type in right there, I want to be baptized. Put me on the list. Get with Pastor Greg. Pastor Greg, thank you for the time tonight.